Well, hello everyone. This week I've been thinking about the things that can go wrong in life. But I don't really have time to discuss all that, so I've concentrated on two areas of life. One, one is injuries. Injuries are quite a good thing in many ways, as long as they're not too serious. And the other thing is illnesses. Now, some illnesses are okay, but other illnesses we just don't talk about. If, for example, you've been injured and you walk around and you've got your head in a bandage and there's a nice little smudge of blood just seeping through above one of the eyebrows, that's not so bad because it immediately suggests heroism of some sort. Similarly, it doesn't do a chap any harm to walk into a room with his arm in a sling. There'll be some little mutterings among those on the couch and the very suggestion might be that he plays rugby or he does something manly, so you're okay with your arms in a sling and you can probably get away with a jaunty little swing if you're on the crutches and you've got one leg in plaster. All this is fine. The, 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 this is the good side of it. Of course, if you get a really bad injury and, and, and you're laid out, it's not much fun at all, so skip around that. Illnesses, too, have, have, have certain categories. You can be quite brave with illnesses but there are some that you simply don't mention. And the ones you can be brave about, for example, are, you know, um, like, like arthritis, and I often make jokes about the creaking of joints and things like that. You can be brave about those, but those ones which are inside the deeper illnesses we don't mention, particularly those which involve the smaller room of the house. And that's, that was the inspiration, really, which made me start thinking about this week's column. You wouldn't, you wouldn't talk about this particular illness. And this is how it began. I was in the back garden. No, it isn't actually how it began. That's another one. Um, some people accept us for what we seem to be. Others want to know what we really are. The second group are the more important and dangerous, for they have a better understanding of human nature. Such silly thoughts were somersaulting through my few remaining brain cells the other day when enthroned in our lavatory, where I have spent rather a lot of time lately reading Edward Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, which, though abridged, is still a hefty tome. I should say here that um, if any of you are Scots, you shouldn't read, because early on Edward Gibbon talks about um, the Scots as sort of naked savages. It's really not an image which either Tony Blair or Gordon Brown would want to cultivate, I feel. But that's by the by. And anyway, so I'm sitting in the smallest room with War and Peace. Uh, no, not War and Peace, but it's, uh, you can understand the mistake, it's decline and fall of the Roman Empire. They'll be singing carols in church before you're out of there, said my wife breezily, as she sprang lightly over the boards on the floor outside. Tell Dad to hurry up, I'm desperate, came the bellow from our twelve-year-old son, who was in the lounge, twisting his legs like a trainee contortionist in the Bulgarian state circus outside the roses bloomed and fell. This always happens after I've dined handsomely on spaghetti bolognese. It is true that I can whirl the fork in the bowl with the expertise of the t-shirted men seen sweating in Mama's kitchen in the Mafia movies, bringing to my lips perfect coils soaked in steaming sauce. Do you get that image? You can see that image. They always have it in these very luridly coloured Mafia movies. They have these guys they come in the vests and the vests and got a bit of stain on the vests and their mother puts before them a great steaming bowl of spaghetti. Um, sadly, this meal, which I love, has a habit of lingering and clogging up my inner workings, but there is a solution. Don't tell me your problems, bring me your solutions, as some American bore once said, providing British bosses with one of the most irritating remarks in their extensive repertoire. Anyway, the solution can be found in a little bottle and a teaspoon. So I entered a chemist's shop deep in town where nobody knew me, eyes darting from east to west, collar high and the brim on my hat low. Have you a light laxative? I bowed conspiratorially to the assistant behind the counter whose face had the complexion of a freshly dumped Garibaldi biscuit highlighted by the glints from her vulgar jewellery. Hey, there's a fella here who needs a laxative, she called to the pharmacist, brewing potions at the back. Yes, I have the blots, I cried, doing a swift jig before the other customers sitting in rows awaiting their prescriptions. Yes, indeed, the blots is my melancholic condition. Why don't we tell the whole world? In sharp contrast, during my crazy years of linked arms, high hopes, poems and sweet fellowship, 
You could have set your clock by me. I was as regular in my habits as the keeper of minutes on the committee at the local history society who only once reported for duty, flustered, panting and steamy-eyed, his regimental tie tucked into his tarling trousers and the shirt tail adrift on his white shirt. The blame for that lapse was laid on the full-lipped and splendidly buxom barmaid of whom much was whispered as heads nodded knowingly and eyebrows arched in quizzical style, particularly, it was said, with saucy voice, that she enjoyed rewarding those who helped her change the beer barrels in the dimly lit cellar. Place of evil. But the keeper of minutes soon became a dull chap again, timing his every activity with the precision of a Swiss watch. Anyway, I can still attribute my inner regularity in those giddy times to the copious quantities of peasant wine which I consumed with carefree abandon beneath my floppy hat on the dusty road of song. Yes, I rather like that image of the floppy hat on the dusty road of song. Sadly, steady work and red wine make uneasy partners. One has to bow if the other is to advance. So I, I adjusted to the new circumstances. However, in life one should always seek the ray of sunshine, and the most obvious blessing of being trapped for hours in a small room is that it gives you more time to think about the ways of the world. For example, my friend, the philosopher, widely noted in town for the cut of his thought and his willingness to express them in the rooms of the bogus and self-regarding, was confronted by a group of people hauling letters after their names between futile committees and pointless conferences do you think I'm an intellectual, he asked. There was much shuffling of feet and quailing of souls before the chairman offered the diplomatic. Yes, on behalf of them all. Well, I am not, said the philosopher, but I do know more than you. It was a terrific response which could only come from incarceration in a small room. From this we may conclude that all the great philosophers, Aristotle, Plato, Sartre, Auntie Gladys, Bertrand Russell and co. were martyrs to constipation. Disgust. Of course, red wine soothes the mind and soul and the stomach. How we enjoy that pop when the cork is pulled in triumph from the first bottle. And may I narrowly tell you it is a sound I have heard many times. And that ends this lesson.